In this video, I'm going to show you how generators work in Python. The video is based on Christian Schramm's article entitled A Gentle Introduction to Generators in Python, which is available at the URL shown here. A generator is simply a convenient way of writing an iterator. And as iterators are used with loops, we'll start by taking a close look at for loops. Here's a simple for loop. It just loops through the list, printing each item one by one. What's interesting about this is that a for loop is just syntactic sugar for a while loop in a try except block. Take a look at this code. Again, we create our list. Then, within a try block, we create an iterator from our list. Then use while true to create an infinite loop. Each iteration through our loop, we use the next function to assign the next item in our iterator to number, and we print number. This will continue until an exception occurs. A stop iteration exception does occur when we try to call next after we've reached the end of our iterator. That exception breaks us out of the while loop. We catch it and do nothing. The iter function just calls the pseudo private iter method of an iterable, which returns an iterator. And the next function just calls the pseudo private next method of the iterator, which, not incidentally, has its own private iter method. In fact, to implement the iterator protocol, in other words, to be an iterator, an object must have both a next method and an iter method. As an aside, I call these methods pseudo private because they aren't really private but the underscores are used to indicate that they're meant to be considered private. However, because they aren't really private, we could rewrite the above code like this. It's not quite as pretty though. To illustrate the inner workings of an iterator, let's create a counter. Here's the code. We have two classes. The counter class has two pseudo private methods, init and iter. The init method just sets the limit property to indicate how high the counter object should count and the iter method returns a counter iterator object. The counter iterator class creates our iterator. It sets a limit property to the limit of the containing counter and a value property starting at zero. Its iter method just returns the object itself and its next method first sets value to self.value so we can remember the current value. Then it increments self.value by one so the next time next is called self.value will be one higher and then it checks to see if there is a limit, and if there is, if value is still under it. If it is, we return the value, and if it's not, then we raise a stop iterator exception. Although counter is a class, we use it like a function, which is why we've named it with a lowercase c. In that way, it is similar to Python's built-in range class. Here's a simple example of looping through our counter object. Instead of using a separate class for our iterator, we can implement the next method right in our counter class and make it its own iterator, like this. There is a small difference though. In the first example, every time we called on it to iterate, it created a new counter iterator object with the initial value set to zero. In the second example, however, the value is kept track of within the counter itself and is never set back to zero, so we can only iterate over the object one time. We could fix that by setting self.value to zero before raising the stop iteration exception, but since we're likely to call counter as if it were a function rather than as a way of initiating an object, we're unlikely to need to iterate through it multiple times. Okay, so it's finally time to start talking about generators. Generators are iterators, but you can only iterate over them one time because they do not store the individual items in memory. When a function uses yield instead of return, it creates a generator. To see how this works, take a look at this simple function. Again, the yield statement tells us that a generator will be returned. We can confirm this using the type function, like so. And you can see it prints class generator. And as generators are iterators, we can loop through the generator that is returned by our function. Let's add a couple of yield statements before and after the loop so that we see exactly what's going on. When we run it, you can see that it prints starting, then prints the values of i, and then prints ending. So each yield statement creates one value in the iterator for each time it's called, and the one in the for loop is called multiple times. Okay, so knowing this, let's change our counter so that it returns a generator. Here's the code. 
In the iter method, we set value to zero, and then in a while loop, we check to see that value hasn't reached our limit, and if it hasn't, we yield value and then increment value by one. We will continue to yield values until the value has reached the limit, if it ever does. Remember in the example before this that the iter method returned the counter object itself. Let's go prove that. If we assign iter counter to my iter and then type my iter, you can see that iter indeed returns a counter object. In the first example, the iter method returned a separate counter iterator object. Let's go prove that the same way. And you can see that it indeed returns a counter iterator object. This generator example is very much like the first example, except that instead of returning a separate counter iterator object, it is returning a separate generator object. Let's again prove that. And we see that it does return a generator object. Let's also prove that the generator object is an iterator. To be an iterator, it must have both an iter and next method defined. And we can see here that it does. Christian demonstrates the same thing in a little bit of a different way, so be sure to check out his explanation under implementation 3, returning a generator. There's something a little weird going on here. Remember that while loop in the try except block we saw in the beginning? Here it is again. We showed that the for loop actually calls the iter method of our iterable to create an iterator and then continues to call the next method of the iterator until it is exhausted. So in this for loop, it calls the iter method of the returned counter object. And that iter method returns a generator, which we just showed has its own iter method. So why are we bothering with the counter class at all? We can just make counter a function that returns a generator, like this. Isn't that a lot simpler? Okay, let's talk about generators versus other types of iterators. The biggest difference between the generator and the iterator that we explicitly created is that the generator returns the full iterator to the caller at once, whereas the explicit iterator returns it value by value and therefore has to save its state between calls to its next method. Let's look at a couple of example use cases for generators. First, a toggle switch and then a tokenizer. A toggle switch is a switch that alternates between true and false. Here's the code for the toggle class that implements the iterator protocol. Notice the iter method just returns itself, and the next method returns the value of self.state. But before doing so, it negates that value, switching it from true to false, or from false to true. And here is a toggle function that returns a generator and works in the same way. In either case, we can loop through toggle like this. It will run infinitely, or until something breaks it out of the loop. I can do that in the console by pressing Control c We could also add a limit parameter to the function, so that it only runs a certain number of times. This is a typical generator, a loop with a single yield statement. But we can get creative and take this one step further, and not save the boolean state at all, by getting rid of the local variable. The only difference here is that if you do have a limit, this one will always return an even number of results. A way around that is to base your yield on your count variable, like this. Count modulus 2 will return 1 or 0, which the bool function will convert to true or false, so we don't have to keep our boolean state in a separate variable. Python 3 puts an emphasis on lazy computation, meaning that it waits as long as possible to execute any given function. Generators fit into this well. They save you from creating an iterator up front and then looping through it, which also saves memory. Because of this memory saving, the benefit of a generator increases with the number of items to iterate over. However, for very small lists, the generator might actually be slower, so wait to optimize until you measure. However, any time you create a function that returns a list, you should consider whether it might be better to return a generator. Another use case for a generator is a tokenizer which takes a potentially very large string and breaks it up into tokens. Because the string is potentially large, a tokenizer would benefit from the lazy computation approach. We'll take a look at two different ways of implementing a tokenizer. The first will return a list, and the second will return a generator. Here's the first implementation that returns a list. Imagine it's called like this. Tokenizer is passed ABC, then a tab, ED, a new line, FG. That value is stored in in str. And then we create two lists, tokens and current token, both of them empty. 
and then we loop through in STR character by character. And if the character is alphanumeric, we append it to current token. Else if current token, meaning that current token has at least one element in it, we append to tokens all the elements of current token joined on an empty string. We then empty our current token list. So taking this string and looping through it, we first look at the first character, A. It's alphanumeric, so we append it to our current token list. We then look at B, also alphanumeric, so we append that to current token as well. Then C, also alphanumeric, so we append that as well. Then backslash T, that's not alphanumeric. So we look at current token, and as we have A, B, and C already in there, we join those elements on an empty string, making an A, B, C string, and we append that to tokens. We then empty the current token list and start populating it again when we get to E. Our second version works in the same way, except that instead of storing the tokens in a tokens list, we just return them with the yield statement as we go. And this, of course, creates a generator and saves us from having to store the tokens list in memory. Christian shows another implementation for a tokenizer, which computes tokens lazily with an OO iterator. Take a look at that in his article, and you'll see how the generator approach saves us a lot of code. Christian also shows a couple of other things in his article. He explains how you can delegate iteration from one generator to another, and he also shows how generators can be used for things other than iteration. So if you're interested in learning more, please check out his article. I hope you found this helpful. Thanks to Christian for letting us use his post as a basis for this video.